Thanks everybody for attending. I hope you had a safe trip in. Welcome back to Charleston. It's awesome to be here. I'm Thomas Romano. I'm the Global Sales Manager for Frontiers. I'll be presenting along with my colleague, Frank Hellig, to give you just a brief introduction to Frontiers and what we're doing. Um, starting out, obviously the uh, group is uh, shaping the future of open access through co-creation, right? So today we'll cover uh, how we work with institutions, government agencies, and consortia to form these types of relationships. We'll also talk about what we do to uh, listen to the institutional needs as we form these models, and we'll discuss our library services as well. So everything we do at Frontier starts with our mission. Our mission is to make science open for all, and we do so by keeping the researcher at the focus. And we allow their research to be disseminated globally and quickly, and by doing so, it helps to uh, provide uh, the research we need to have healthy lives on a healthy planet, right? Our groundbreaking technology we use is um, built with AI intelligence. It helps to expedite the review and publishing process, and as a result, to disseminate the information quickly. As a result, we've had over 2.1 billion views of our content, and that's just a, the power of open science. As a result of our efforts, Frontiers is the sixth largest publisher, and this is based on the top 20 publishers by number of published articles <coughs> in 2022. You can see that our positioning is strong, and we continue to climb. And we do remain the third most cited publisher. This is based on average citations in 2022 for articles published in 19, 20, and 21. And we're just creeping to the top and growing. So we look forward to that, that challenge. And we do so by having a global network of editors. And our editors really are affiliated with top institutions and uh, groups uh, globally. Obviously, the University of California system, we have over 2,500 editors and growing. You look at some of the names, they might be here today with us. Uh, Harvard, University of Texas system, uh, Florida, uh, North Carolina, Johns Hopkins, Stanford, Cornell, The Ohio State, McGill, uh, University of Pennsylvania. So big names, and we do so by aligning with the top talent at those universities. We also share in uh, encouraging science to be open for all. We do so by creating communities to help to um, accelerate that process. I have provided four different examples today, one of which is our groundbreaking frontiers for young minds. This journal is Science for Kids that's edited by kids 8 to 15. And the editor-in-chief is uh, Professor Robert Knight from UC Berkeley. We catch the kids young, we get them excited about science, they go on to become the researchers and uh, scientists of our future. We also have a Frontiers Forum Live, where we connect global communities across science, policy, and society, bringing them all together. Um, next year, I believe, is going to be a virtual, and then we'll continue with the live the following year. We also offer a Frontiers Planet Prize. This brings nations and universities together to compete internationally for the opportunity to win one of three uh, one million dollar um, frank prizes so we give away three of those three million in total and we also form society partnerships where we work with society publishers to help to accelerate the process of their content by creating long-term relationships with the best learned societies now i'll touch briefly on what policy and um, changes are occurring in the u.s Right now, many of you know, last year around August, the OSTP memorandum came out. And it was, it was requesting federally that we help to ensure free, immediate, and equitable access for federally funded research. So where are we today? We're over a year into it. And if you would like to learn more, I would love to have you attend tomorrow's session with my uh, esteemed colleague, Tom, here. He'll, presenting, uh, he'll be presenting on the OSTP public access guidance after one year, what we've learned and where we go from here. And it's all about focusing on the zero embargo, discoverability, and uh, phasing out the uh, three-year uh, wait. Um, just know that Frontiers is on day one compliant with all of these. 
And there has been a movement, especially in the U.S., with the Helios movement. And this was formed, um, over 80 colleges are participating, universities that emerged from the uh, National Academic Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine, where that round table came to the decision that universities need to form um, coordinated efforts to support uh, fully open access publishers. And now onto our institutional partnerships, just briefly covering what those do and how they can support institutional needs. With Frontiers, we believe uh, we want to be the trusted partners in open science. And we do so by providing institutions with the information they need to make these informed decisions. It starts by aligning our missions and core values to make sure we're on the same page and they have the same initiatives with their open access agreements. We provide insights into policy and funder trends uh, to help with that movement as well. And we ensure academic integrity through transparent agreements that are publicly available. We also help with a really tough task because when you're a fully native open science publisher, institutions don't necessarily have the funding available to support uh, your publishing output. So we help to, uh, with that process to find the funding to support it, <coughs> publishing engagement, your activity at your university, and to support equitable access for every, every uh, discipline at your university. We also, as a result of our agreements, we help to elevate the university and researchers' profiles globally. And lastly, as a fully native publisher, we recognize our authors and the researchers as authors and readers. So you, you may always read for free with Frontiers. And the results are in. <laughs> we have over 700 uh, agreements, institutional partnership agreements, and growing. You'll see the names, many of them are here in the room today. Uh, we form uh, both alliances with universities, uh, funders, and consortia groups. And on a national scale, we have over 12 national agreements in place, with the newest one being our agreement with the University of California system. Uh, a new pilot I'll discuss in a moment. And just know that something else is very important. We have an alliance with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. That means they have their own dashboard. And so if an in institution uh, publishes an article, it goes to their dashboard, they can approve it, and then the institution would never see that bill. So it helps to stretch the library's budget and to help, um, <clears throat> excuse me, accelerate that process more. Now, some of the um, benefits of our proprietary workflow and dashboard we created. We provide the utmost uh, white glove service when it comes to our customer experience. Some highlights are that we have a dedicated customer engagement uh, specialist that's dedicated to your particular uh, agreement. We provide hands-on onboarding, collaborative marketing to get the message out and create that awareness you need. We provide per personalized support with librarians and researchers. And we have a funding dashboard that's um, available 24-7 that also serves as a self-service for downloading uh, CSV files and data. And we offer flexible workflows that my colleague will discuss shortly. And the moment we've all been waiting for. We just secured this year our first flat fee agreement with the University of California system. That means that with tw uh, 20 of our journals in the humanities and social sciences and sustainability disciplines, they may uh, publish unlimited with frontiers. That includes all 10 of the UC systems, uh, UC uh, campuses rather, and the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. So groundbreaking for us, and it takes the burden of paying for the APC off of the, public, uh, the researcher and centralizes it through the library system. And now we, as of last week, we just announced our second agreement, which is with the University of Kansas. It covers all of their publishing, and it includes all of our journals. So we have over 203 journals currently. They're all covered um, through this system. The uh, University of Kansas was really eager to start a flat fee model to take on that support of their researchers, and we were able to deliver that. And lastly, I'll just leave with a few powerful testimonials from the University of California for the flat fee pilot. Um, as a native open access publisher, Frontiers is a natural ally in our efforts to advance a more open, equitable, 
and transparent publishing landscape, said Miranda Bennett, Director of Shared Collections at UC California Digital Library. She goes on to say the pilot allows us to collaborate with a major publisher of UC authored research as we explore new models for uh, partnerships between institutions and native open access publishers. And one of her colleagues, uh, which is Maria DiPrano, a professor at the, um, of art and history at the UC Merced and chair of the UC faculty of um, Academic Senate's University Committee on Library and Scholarly Communication said, I applaud UC's new pilot agreement with Frontier. And in particular, it acknowledged its acknowledgement of the need to increase funding in support of UC authors who publish open access in humanities and social sciences. So thank you so much. I'll turn it over to my colleague now. Great. Thanks, Tom. Yep. So just another five slides. Uh, I want to focus on how we are getting to initiatives like the, the pilots uh, Tom just presented, and with a particular focus on the term co-creation, which uh, is also a title of our presentation. Um, so just I just throw together here like what I say is co-elements of, of what um, co-creation to get to that future entails. And I want to focus specifically on these four points, um, which are part of what you could call a co-creation framework. Yeah? But before I go into those, I want to explain or remind what these solutions actually are. I mean, it came across already, well, I think, uh, in what Tom uh, presented. But it is about um, so solutions which support institutions in supporting their authors, in fully supporting them, in supporting all authors, also financially, of course. And it, it is uh, about authors not having to deal with the admin anymore related to payment. And it is also about not just making articles open access, which is kind of what frontiers at least a given, but also making them um, free to publish. Um, and the solutions entail, obviously, a whole host of services. So um, Tom showed the dashboard, for example. So it's about payment management tools. It's about reporting. But it is it is also really about the partnership as such, about partnership models and, and the business model behind it. And that's what I actually want to focus on today. And the four elements are a full commitment to transition to institutional partnerships, what we can call institutionally contracted open access models, right? And also a, com a commitment to innovating these models. Secondly, um, we recognize, we observe policy trends as one way of seeing what the institutions actually want. Uh, thirdly, we uh, actively embed uh, directly discussions with the institutions in, 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 in taking that into account in developing uh, new solutions and new models. And finally, a, a real world exper experimentationally, and I mean, it's a bit fancy of a word, but it's basically as pilots Tom was already mentioning. I illustrate this a little bit abstractly here, but uh, let's talk about this after the presentation. Next slide, please. Um, so the first element of this co-creation framework is really this commitment to um, uh, institutionally contracted open access uh, models or, or institutional partnerships in the first place. Yeah, so there's a lot of focus um, in, in, in our uh, circles about uh, traditional publishers transitioning to uh, open access. Yeah, so, so there's a transition phase, so this is a sequence here on the left side. There's a transition stage uh, of, of hybrid models and uh, eventually may or may not lead to also full open access. Uh, but uh, the point that we are trying to make here is that this is all the way through due to their legacy. Uh, they, they already have very well established relationships with institutions and consortia. Um, while on the other side, fully open access publishers, they are all the way through open access already. Let's since the inception in 2007, Frontiers is fully open access. But we have another transition uh, at, at our hands. Yeah, we have to uh, transition from what is currently mainly still all for facing fees to what we could call institutionally contracted or institutional partnerships, yeah? And then eventually this leads to a fully open access uh, institutionally contracted. And institutions want that as well, yeah? Uh, not the least, not the least uh, because um, uh, authors choosing to, to uh, publish with publishers like that uh, uh, should be equally supported. I just put your uh, public statements uh, uh, along those two commitments and maybe just worth pointing out that uh, we have a goal of really having all articles covered within five years under institutional, publish, institutional publishers. And regarding model innovation, we want to do this together with institutions. Next slide. 
Uh, very quickly only, yeah. So before I go actually to the uh, third element, the next slide, which is about um, uh, embedding uh, directly institutions' input, we of course observe the environment, yeah. And and it is it's aiding the model innovation because it's basically a for already formalized, nicely publicly available set of information we can use for that, yeah. Uh, I just picked a few here, by no means um, complete. I also added a couple of quotes, uh, which I think are. <coughs> Um, with regard to the first two, um, uh, I kind of contradict myself immediately. It's uh, on the one side, like uh, aiding our mo generally aiding model um, innovation, but it's also the other way around. Yeah, Frontiers is fully open access already, has never had hybrid, so it's also influencing policy. So it's kind of bi directional. But nevertheless, all of these points are had kind of indicators of needs, and we take that into account, we address them already and we invest, investigate further, including some of the newer uh, terms like equity and so forth. Yeah? And the last point that's uh, actually uh, here, the Council of the EU has uh, issued a statement, not only uh, also um, saying that the needed um, open access uh, form to be the norm, but also that like uh, costs should not be covered by individual authors. Yeah? That's exactly what the institutional partnerships program is about. Next slide. Uh, as mentioned, uh, besides observing what's going on and then the applications and so forth, uh, we, we have uh, uh, created a whole set of uh, formats how we um, take input from institutions into account. Yeah, it might be obvious for some older, bigger publishers, but for, for us this is a great achievement. And we have, like, for example, uh, uh, the second annual survey. This is not a trivial task to survey like uh, six, five hundred, I don't know, um, institutions um, about what they think, what they want uh, to see in the future and so forth. We have done uh, a handful of focus groups uh, and also discussion forums with Pandas, for example, also. We have done a couple of dozen expert interviews. It's a particular format with quite like deep dive, deep dive uh, kind of questions. Then these pilot partnerships, the next slide will be about that, but here it's very important to have feedback in the process to getting there and starting, and then also while they are running, yeah, and then refine these models and and so forth. And, and just a, a, quick, a quick couple more notes, obviously at conferences, we want to talk to you uh, here a lot, for example, and we also want to create an advisory group. And if you are interested to be involved in any of these initiatives, yeah, please get in touch, yeah? So uh, I'll, I'll have the contact information at the end. Uh, next slide. Which is uh, wrapping up. Uh, Co-creation uh, framework has this uh, experimentation lane. It's all about like uh, pilot models, yeah? And as Tom already like um, showed, we are really proud that we can now uh, add flat fee or at a, at a pilot stage a flat fee model to our repertoire. Um, and we have, as Tom said, already uh, two agreements uh, set up. But they, they, they address particular needs. Some of them are like uh, existing for a long time. Some of them are, are newer. Uh, and I've written them here. I'm not reading them out yet. But the point I want to make, it is really a case in point. We have heard them maybe two or three years ago for the first time. Then we have heard them again. Then, then we like had um, a dedicated sessions with uh, librarians and eventually had a business case. and can now offer it uh, as a, a formalized pilot model. Um, and uh, I call it a lane because obviously these pilots can become standard models. I just illustrated here on the left side. And uh, finally, bottom uh, right, this is what we are working on now. Yeah, And this is where we really want your input. So for example, in the US, perhaps of interest, uh, the multi-pair model is something we are looking into. If you have any opinions, um, get in touch. Uh, and the final slide is our contact details. Um, and once more, I want to point not just to, uh, to Tom's um, from CBO for, um, uh, presentation, but also Julia is also in the room here, um, and we have another panel, uh, and we also have two booths actually. Um, and I also not mentioned here. I want to point to a focus group we are having right in this room, uh, starting in eight minutes or something like this. And I believe they have a couple of places uh, still open. Yeah, it's just an hour. There will be food. And if you are interested, uh, Helena Meskanen uh, over there, um, uh, just talk to her. Yeah? And with this, uh, thank you for your attention. And I believe we have a few yeah. minutes for yeah. questions. Yeah. Open. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And we're open to questions. Um, we do have a colleague here that handles our publishing side as well. So uh, we have policy questions, whatever you'd like. 
Uh, yeah, Tom, you mentioned uh, in your, one of your slides something about society partnerships. Um, are you aspiring doing something similar while in Elsevier to partner or hosting journals that are owned by the society and that societies can use your workflow and your, um, your, your, your platform for, for their journals, given that they are full open access, of course, yeah. Well, it's called the publishing partnerships, which is different from institutional partnerships right, in our yeah. terminology. Yeah, and I believe there are different types of publishing. <coughs> I'm not entirely sure about the the ownership, but it definitely it definitely is about uh, so the, so the editorial boards, established right. journals, sometimes newly formed journals, all use exactly as you say uh, the uh, very good uh, uh, platform Frontiers uh, has developed over the last fifteen years. Um, I don't know, Julia, whether you want to chip in. Um, I'm happy to. Hi, I'm Julia Gosselin. I'm the publishing director for Frontiers in the US. Um, and absolutely, I mean, we are very much open to working with society partners. I think one of, I, I should say that in the in my past lives, I have worked a lot with societies in various uh, groups and so, uh, in various fields. And so one of the challenges that we know of society space, especially if they're mid size or smaller size, is how they can transition sustainably toward open access. There is very often, you know, a lot of interest in the research communities that they serve in open access. Sometimes, especially when they partner with big publishers, um, you know, the finances or the, the kind of mission alignment might kind of slide off a little yeah. bit. And so we're looking to certainly support societies as they move toward this transition you know, financially, but also, as you said, you know, and as, as Frank said, in terms of the infrastructure that is needed, in terms of the support, the various, um, uh, you know, partnership models and things like that. Yeah. Thank you. Happy to ask some more questions afterwards. Any uh, questions? Yes. Yes. Uh, Brigitte Krom from the Austrian Consortium. Hey. So uh, it was very interesting for me. So as I understand, you have a new model for costs. So it means you don't, we would not have to pay uh, an APC for uh, every it's month, APC but I pay a flat fee for one year. Or, mm -hmm. yeah. So I would be interested what do you take into account for calculating this flat fee? Because we are also in Austria, we are calculating a new cost key for the institutions. So what, what, so what is Very the most uh, important uh, factor? Uh, is it, it would be, I would expect, already again the number of articles. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I, I'd love to talk more about that. And actually, uh, I would even like partially put flat fee also in the bottom right uh, corner with the question mark. Yeah, because while well, flat fee obviously has some key parameters. Yeah, uh, I think you had it also in your slide, right? That it is uh, about an annual, usually an annual payment for unlimited number of articles. But <coughs> we calculate that is, is uh, still, uh, we have definitely a way to do it now, and you're right, the, the historic number of articles is somehow taken into account, also historic APCs are somehow taken into account, but we have already, like after we started uh, working with that in spring, uh, like a, a, whole, a whole set of different ways how we do that, yeah. And, and the question mark order of my circle, yeah, we are definitely want to actually hear from you of what would you yes. like to take attend, into account, the, yeah? The tennis session right <laughs> after. Yeah, yeah. It, yeah, really, really, Not join, our, join our focus group now. I tell you, I also have no solution for <laughs> <laughs> that's 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 the That's the ideas, yeah. yeah. I have a list in my head, which I'm not going to talk about now, but, but if you join your focus group, or we have a chat afterwards, I can tell you these parameters uh, we could take into account. This instead. is literally co-creation. Right? <laughs> <laughs> really what it's about. We don't have all the answers either, but listening, and then fold, you know, folding that together and making the answers. Any other questions? Well, it's a great group. We appreciate you attending. Hope you have a wonderful time here at Charleston, and thank you so much. Thank you.